Hello friends, happy Wednesday. Hope your day is going great so far. Um, yes, I wanna go ahead and um, continue on chapter nine. We started yesterday, uh, it's called Private Interpretation. And we started talking about the first half of the chapter, um, just the movement that was the Reformation as far as, um, uh, um, oh my gosh, I forgot his name, Martin Luther. <laughs> As far as Martin Luther and what he did when it came to, yeah, having the Bible in our own language and, um, yes, and taking the power away from the Catholic Church to let them be the sole um, uh, people or the group to be able to interpret the scriptures, okay? Um, he uh, pretty much was a monk who uh, was told, here, teach the Bible. And so reading actually through scripture the Holy Spirit convicted him, um, letting him know, hey, the church back then, the Catholic church was not doing it correctly. They were pretty much making up stuff and telling people um, that salvation was through other means, but by the way that God or the Bible uh, claimed that it is, which is through grace. Okay, so when he did that, he did two things we talked about. Um, number one, he took that power away from the, um, the Roman church. Um, and giving that power to us, right? Because they are not the only ones or that they don't, they claim to have even the same authority as the Bible. And that is not true because the church is made out of sinners, redeemed, but we are sinners nonetheless. We are not infallible. We are fallible. So um, he did that. And second, he was able to translate the Bible into his uh, the language that the people knew. And that way, everybody was able to read it. And everybody was able to interpret it, not in their own ways, but have um, have God directly speak to them and not be like the telephone game that, you know, uh, apparently the Catholic Church was saying that God was speaking to them and then they were able to interpret it to us. Um, we have one-on-one -on -one, um, means now to be able to, uh, yeah, to have God reveal things to us personally through his scripture because, um, yeah, because we have it in our language. So that is what Martin Luther did. Uh, but what happened, which was obviously there's pros and cons to everything. One of the big con was that now it called for individual interpretation. And now the people had the Bible, had the scripture, the holy, you know, um, word of God. And what what is ha what happened back then is what honestly a lot a lot of it happens today so i'm trying to look at my time to make sure i don't go over because i feel like sometimes lately i've been going over um and uh so now what people are doing are saying well to me this verse means this um and opens up the interpretation for people for people to interpret it the way that they think it is and that's wrong because there was a purpose and there was a unified message, um, you know, or there is in the scriptures, in the Bible. And that is not for us, not enough for us to interpret it the way that we will, the way that we feel like it. But it's the way we should interpret it in the way that God calls us to um, in the one interpretation, in the one message that God has for us. So that was an issue that was going on now that everybody was able to have the scriptures with them. And certainly the Catholic Church um, was saying that this was something why they didn't, they didn't want to give the scriptures to people. But um, looking at the balance, right? Yes, you have the con of people having that, you know, private interpretation. But what holds a higher weight is that now they have the word of God for it to clear itself out, for it to be, a, you know, among debates, among interpretation, the Bible is able to clear itself out in these debates and speak for itself. And that is the power of God, of revelation that he gives to us. Um, so that's what Martin Luther did. So let's continue reading on here. That was just pretty much what we talked about yesterday. Um, and this is what I was talking about was subjective interpretation. All right. Not objective, but meaning what, how do I see it? What does it mean to me? All right, so this is subjectivism. So subjectivism has been the great danger of private interpretation. That's what R.C. Sproul says. Yet the principle of, oh, sorry, I forgot to let you guys know. So we're continuing our study in the book of Essential Truths of Christian Faith by R.C. Sproul. And you want me to send you a picture of the book because you want to get it? By all means, just private message me and I'll send you a link to where you are, you're able to purchase it, okay? Again, subjectivism has been the great danger of private interpretation. Yet the principle of private interpretation does not mean that God's people have the right to interpret the Bible in whatever manner they wish. So we don't have that power to say, well, whatever, today this verse means this to me. And tomorrow it means this, like art. You know how like if you see like art pieces, well, to me I see, or like the clouds in the sky, you know how people are like, well, to me that looks like a camel or that looks like a star. No, the word of God is not that. It has a direct message, okay? Um, 
along with the right to interpret scripture, which is that what now what the people have because they had the scriptures in their language, the responsibility to and they also have the responsibility to interpret it properly. If you don't, um, it's not going to have the effect in your life that it should. If I'm over here giving it meaning and giving interpreting it my way, then it kind of nullifies the power of the word of God because you're not letting it go into your life in the way that it should and start cleaning things up and start really challenging you. You know That's why it's so important for us to be honest in what we're reading and how we're reading it because that's how it's going to produce the fruit. If we don't, it's not going to do the fruit or produce the fruit. Believers are free to discover the truth of scripture, but they are not free to fabricate their own truths. And that is what's going on nowadays in the church. And this is why, you know, um, again, I recommend recommended the, the movie American Gospel because that is what American Christianity is. The predominant um, Christian views in America um, are the ones that they show in that, in that movie, which is sort of prosperity gospel, which is, um, yeah, things are not biblical at all. And that's why we need to know this so well that we're able to point out things that are false, okay? A lot of believers, a lot of pastors are coming up with their own theories or their own ideas and looking for Bible verses that manipulated could back up what they're saying um, because they're manipulating it. Because if you back up and you see um, that subject in other areas in the Bible, it will make it clear that that's not what it's talking about. Okay, believers are called to understand sound principles of interpretation and to avoid the danger of subject subjectivism. This is why we're doing even going through this book. And this is why it's so important for us to know all this, you know, uh, before we try to dive into the word of God. <sighs> not knowing all this because you could do it and then, I don't know, not get all the full effect that God's word can have in you if you don't, if you don't keep all that in mind. Okay, in seeking an objective understanding of scripture, we do not thereby reduce scripture to something cold, abstract, or lifeless. That's what people think. If you look at it just objectively, it's going to be very abstract, it's going to be very lifeless, it's not going to be like nice and what? No, not at all. Um, what we are doing is seeking to understand what the word says in its context before we go about the equal necessary the equality necessary, the equal, I don't know how to read guys. Um, let me read that again. What we are doing is seeking to understand what we're doing as far as uh, looking at it objectively. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. What we're doing, uh, uh, looking at it objectively is seeking to understand what the word of God says in its context before we go about the equally necessary task of applying it to our lives. This right here is something that I learned, honestly, Maybe in the last six months, going to the church that I have now, um, I feel like a lot of times we do like this Bible roulette where we just open it up. I'm like, okay, I'm having a bad day. Uh, right here. This is for me. And I will set fire to Egypt. Pulsium shall be in great agony. Um, they should fall on their faces. Boom. That is for me. Right there. That's for me. No, that is not how we are meant to read scripture. That is not how we are meant to apply this to our lives. The first thing we need to do is look at the context that we're reading, who's writing it, who are they writing it to, what's the message they are sending, and after I have figured all that information, then I can say, okay, God, what do you, what, how do you want me to apply this in my life? How can this fit in my life? Okay, instead of saying, looking at, for example, the story of um, David and Goliath, and thinking, I'm David. I'm David and my bad situations and all, everything bad is coming to me is Goliath. And you know what? And with God's strength, I'm going to kill, you know, Goliath and I'm going to kill. That is the wrong interpretation. People read that and that is the wrong interpretation of that story. Looking at it, we see that we are not at all David. Jesus is David because Jesus was one who conquered something that was completely unconquerable, which was death and sin, you know? So looking at it that way in the interpretation that we should be is how we can see how we can apply this to our lives, okay? So again, before applying it to our lives, we have to see the context that it is in, and we have to do our homework to dive really deep into it in the way that we are meant to, to then really squeeze that juice out and apply it to our lives, okay? A particular statement may have numerous possible personal applications but it can only have one correct meaning the meaning of the passage is only one single one meaning 
but I can apply it to my life in different ways, in different situations. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's not like I'm interpreting it the way that I, it fits me. It has the meaning and then I can see in different areas, in different seasons of my life that I can apply it. Okay, and that's personal because we are all different, right? Um, the right to interpret scripture carries with it the obligation to interpret it correctly. The Bible is not a waxed nose to be shaped and formed to suit the views of the interpreter. So the Bible is not, you know, like they have those wax, no wax noses that you can like bend them this way and then bend them that way and push them up, and squeeze them and do anything that you want, mold it however you want. The Bible is not like that. Just like laws and the Constitution are not bendable they're not moldable they are set right and that's just laws constitution this is the word of god this is him spoken this is a message that he has for us we are um it's heresy for me to get god's word and twist it and manipulate it into what i think it's true odds are if i think it's true it's probably false right if it's not guided by the holy spirit and this and and uh and this word and the word of god this and this in the bible odds are it's probably false okay um, so he gives us here a couple of Bible verses for us to look up um, that talk about this. And I'm going to look for two of them. I should have had, had this open. I don't know why I didn't have it marked. But the first one is called, is in Nehemiah 8, verse uh, chapter 8, verse 8. Again, Nehemiah. Where is Nehemiah? Is um, the small minor prophet. My kids know like all their Bible, like all their, uh, how do you say their books in the Bible? I can find Nehemiah. I would look it up in my, in my phone, but I'm doing, I'm using my phone to go live. I will find it. I will find it. Uh, if you have your Bible, look it up. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. I had it yesterday. Lamentations, Ezekiel. Also, because, yeah. It's coming, it's coming. I feel it. I'm going to go to my table of contents because now if I can't find it the first time, then I'm going to go crazy. Nehemiah is after, before numbers 481. 481. I have to look at Here we go. Okay, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. Where are we? Okay, it said... Um, they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. I'm guessing this was obviously in the Old Testament when they were reading uh, God's law. God's people was reading were reading their laws. It says they read from the book, meaning the law, okay, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. So it was clear that it was only one meaning, right because they all understood the meaning and they were all um in the same mind they had the same uh, meaning and interpretation because there's only one right so the majority of them got together they all read the scriptures they all read the word of law the, the word of god the law of god and they were one in mind in that sense in that sense right and that's a holy spirit speaking that's a holy spirit moving because each of them didn't have their own interpretation no they had one okay it says here gave uh, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading they all understood the same meaning okay so that's proof right there that we're reading scripture right um, there is only one meaning, one interpretation. Different applications, I can apply, apply it differently in my life, but it has to be one meaning. And the next one, he has he has three, four more here, but I'm only going to read one more. The next one is 2 Timothy 2.15, if you're jotting down. 2 Timothy 3, <coughs> excuse me, 14 to 17. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. And I'm going to read 2 Peter 1, 2, 20 and 21. This one right here was like, for me was jaw dropping. I read this and I'm like, this is in the Bible. And it was amazing um, because the Bible, like I said, proves itself. The Bible, you don't have to defend the Bible. The Bible does it for itself. There's no need for you to be like, well, I have to prove it. I have to No, This is literally scripture. And this is how it's proved that it's the word of God. So that is found again in second Peter chapter one, verses 20 and 21. Get this. This is what it says. It says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke 
from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So pretty much here what Peter is saying that no prophecy in scripture, meaning anything that was was um, revealed in scripture, comes from one's own interpretation, right? So this is not like, okay, I'm going to read it and the interpretation like I've been saying this whole time is whatever I feel like today, this scripture may see something different to you as, as, it, does, as it does to me. That is a lie. That is the lie from the devil. No, there is one interpretation. It does not come from man. It comes from, and it says here, the Holy Spirit. Okay? So the interpretation that I will get from the scriptures um, is from the Holy Spirit. It's like the Holy Spirit are the glasses you put on when you read. So you can actually see what the scripture says. That's why somebody who's not a believer can read the scripture and not understand it. And say, whoop, I don't get it. Because we need the Holy Spirit in us. And for us to accept and have the Holy Spirit, it has to be um, that we are born again, that we have Jesus into our, in our hearts, that we follow Jesus, that we have turned from our wicked ways and now are following him. Seek a life that honors him. Our hope is in him. Living a life that honors him. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. And now we are able to read scripture and actually get the actual meaning that it's saying. And this even like, I think about it, and I'm like, man... Maybe that's why you see people that call themselves Christians and pastors that call themselves pastors coming up with like the most weirdest interpretation from scripture and stories and Bible verses. And I'm like, maybe it's because they don't have the Holy Spirit. I know that's pretty radical, but it's true because if you have the Holy Spirit, he is going to guide you into the truth of what that scripture or that passage or that book or that chapter is telling you. You are not doing it by yourself. This is what even Peter is saying. I'm going to read it again. It says, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scriptures comes from someone's own interpretation. If it does, it's false, which is what we see so much here in America and in the world. Okay? For no prophecy or no scripture or no passage or no Bible verse or no story from the Bible was ever produced by the will of man. Um, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, so yes, so those were the Bible verses that he includes. Arshis Pro includes to back up what he's seeing in this chapter. So I'll go through the... Okay, it's been 15 minutes. I'll hurry up. I'm going to go through the summary statements that he has at the end of each uh, chapter, and then we'll be done. So the first one is, The Reformation gave to the church a translation of the Bible in the common language and to teach believer and to each believer the right and responsibility of private interpretation of the bible meaning god is now speaking to them directly from the scriptures they don't have somebody telling them what god's saying god is speaking to them directly uh, number two church tradition through instructive as a guide sorry church tradition though instructive as a guide tradition is not like necessarily bad okay if it's if it falls alongside of what the bible says does not have equal authority with the scripture tradition is below below scripture scripture is up here all right uh three private interpretation is not a license for subjectivism meaning whatever i feel like this verse is telling you today no no, none of that. Four, the principle of private interpretation carries with it the obligation to seek the correct interpretation of the Bible. It is our duty to get the right interpretation through the Holy Spirit. Five, though each biblical text may have multiple applications in my life, it has only one correct meaning. Okay? That was a lot. All right, guys, that's about it. Have an amazing day. This video will be up for the next 24 hours and it will be up on if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, it'll be up here forever. I love you and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.